So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this year's first Max Weber lecture. And we are very honored to have, have with us today uh, Professor Kartik Muralidharan from um, the University of California at San Diego, who has a long list of very impressive publications in all the top economics journals and has recently written a big book, which is, is big. It's like, <laughs> it's like uh, Piketty's Capital, maybe even bigger, on um, accelerating India's development. Well, there we go. Look at that. <laughs> Where he, uh, you can put it here, exactly where he summarizes and pulls together a lot of his, his work and a lot of the work that he's interested in on uh, development, and especially in case, of, in case of India. And um, good. We are, and this session will be uh, chaired by Melike Kirkisil, who is a Max Weber Fellow with us in economics, and she will provide a bit longer introduction to our today's speaker. So I'll leave the floor to you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you yeah, for the short introduction. Uh, I'm Melike Kökızıl, a Max Weber Fellow. It's a pleasure to me uh, to introduce our esteemed guest, Professor Kardik Muralidharan. Professor Muralidharan is an economics professor at University of California, uh, San Diego. He is widely recognized for his work in public policy, development economics, and governance particularly in the context of India's education and public service delivery systems. His research mainly combines rigorous field experiments with uh, practical policy solutions, and they have been published in the top economics journal, including American Economic Review, Quarterly Journal of Economics, and Journal of Political Economy. His research also gets media attention widely, and they are featured in global media outlets, including New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and Economist, in addition to several leading Indian newspapers. Also, he's actively involved in policy advising and capacity building in India. Our host today, throughout his career, developed many large-scale experiments in public service, and he has countless experience with the policymakers and bureaucrats. He has worked closely with state governments in India, where he was born and raised. Based on these experiences and plenty of his research, he has written an amazing book on how to build effective governance. Today, our guest will talk about this recent book, Accelerating India's, government, India's Development, a Roadmap for Effective Governance, where he outlines the strategies for enhancing capacity, uh, state capacity and effective governance. The book indeed dedicated to the Indian people, nevertheless, in my opinion, and probably everyone in the hall would agree to me that the book gives uh, some um, useful insights for many developing countries around the world and provides a clear roadmap for achieving a sustainable development. We are thrilled to have him today to share his insight. So please join me in welcoming Professor Kardi uh, Karani Kral Diyala. Um, uh. Thank you so much. Uh, it really is is a pleasure and an honor um, to to do the Max Weber lecture because, like I was telling Juho at lunch, you know, economists normally don't write books right like this, right? I mean, most of what we do is write individual research papers, and and the the honor of giving the Weber lecture, given that this is a book about bureaucracy, is is particularly you know appropriate. And it's also a very kind of out of the uh, ordinary book because while the core is economics, it really touches on a lot of political science, psychology, ethics, uh, organizations, sociology. So it's kind of a very broad canvas social science book, which I think uh, reflects my own interests, though the papers themselves have been in economics. So I'm really thrilled uh, to present this. So as, as, uh, as Malikia was saying, 
This is a book that is primarily about India, but there will be a global edition next year uh, by Oxford University Press that will be called Accelerating Development, a roadmap for and from India. So it's clear that the ideas are about India, but the, that they're relevant much more broadly. Okay, so since many of you don't know India and many of you aren't even economists, I thought I would just start by just outlining, you know, what are the goals of the talk itself? Okay, so I guess I'm always going to lose the top of the slide because of the recording. That's fine. So... <laughs> So I think, you know, the reason this book, so it's 800 pages, but I promise it's an easy read, okay? And it's only 600 pages because 200 are notes and references, okay? Um, and so it has intellectual goals, it has education goals, it has policy goals, right? Um, and the intellectual goal of the book really is to bring the topic of state capacity to the core of development discourse, okay? And so one way to think about this is that... Mm, like as academic economists, we spend much more time discussing what governments should do, but much less on how will they do it or whether they even can do it. OK, and so if you look at kind of the intellectual history of modern development economics post World War Two, we have this huge wave of work focusing on what should governments do. OK, but it's precisely because we didn't pay enough attention to implementation and capacity that you got this laundry list of well intentioned failed projects that you get people like Bill Easterly then talking about white man's burden. Right. I mean, about how we have these well intentioned ideas that don't get implemented. OK, I would say the last 30 years we then moved to a second phase where people understand that state capacity is a problem, okay? So we know that state capacity is a challenge, but the donor agencies, whether it's the World Bank, whether it's the Gates Foundation, whether it's many bilateral aid agencies, in general, the way they handle this is they think state capacity is too difficult to take on. And so you build these project management units that help to implement your specific project, okay? So the way I tell the story is because these donors are accountable to their own stakeholders in high income countries, it's like you're trying to implement projects in third world conditions under first world fiduciary standards, okay? So you try to ring fence your project with high quality procurement, auditing, et cetera, but that may only apply to two or 3% of the budget, right? Whereas the core of the state is its own budget, its own processes. How does the government function? Okay, so what I'm arguing for in this book, and I'll tell you why, is that we really need to bring this question about building effective states to the core of global development discourse, because that is the binding constraint for almost every global development goal. Okay, you can't be talking about climate change, you can't be talking about pandemic mitigation, if the country governments are not capable of implementing the ideas that we kind of think should be implemented. Okay, so, uh, so that's, I think, like one core goal. Now, it's not enough to just say state capacity, right? I think, um, and this is what I was talking at lunch to Juho and others, is that <clears throat> like the core intellectual contribution of the book is to get into the black box of state capacity and think about the state as an organization and hence my interest in organizational sociology, right? To put some structure around how to understand a state and make it work better. And then there's also a goal of synthesizing a body of high quality empirical evidence. A lot of this comes from economics. So the way to think about this is the evidence I'm talking about is mainly economics, but the frameworks with which I'm organizing it actually come from other fields, okay? So that's kind of how you should think about the juxtaposition because often the micro studies in economics don't give you macro organizing frameworks for how to put these studies together, okay? And so I think the value of the book, even for an academic reader, is really the synthesis and the frameworks for how do you interpret this body of work that's relevant for both research and policy. A second key goal is really just public education. So most of the effort in writing the book has gone in simplifying the language. And so the idea is really to make complex ideas accessible in a non-technical way that any college student in any subject or even a motivated high school student should be able to read to just better understand the functioning of the Indian state why it doesn't deliver well enough and how to make it better. And then for those of you like, you know, who are curious about India, but don't know much, this is also a primer on India that can be part of like, you know, uh, a crash course on India with principles that are relevant across countries, right? And the last goal is policy, right? And that's, I think the book really doesn't fit any genre, partly because there's a nice review by Alex Tabarrok and Marginal Revolution that a lot of the big books in development tend to be retrospective, okay? So you, like, Why Nations Fail will look back and saying, here are the patterns that make countries successful or fail, but it doesn't really tell a policymaker today, what do you need to do, okay? And so the book reflects 
Uh, the philosophy of an article by Greg Mankiw in the Journal of Economic Perspectives in 2006, where he said the macroeconomist as a scientist and an engineer. Okay, So as a scientist, we're trying to understand the world, but as an engineer, you're trying to take that understanding to build a better world. Okay, So similarly, the book aims to do both social science, where the first half of every chapter is kind of understanding facts, and the second half is how do you then do systems engineering, because it's not a simple mechanical engineering problem, it's really about complex systems, okay? And, and so the idea is to also then provide a set of practical ideas that can improve governance, state capacity, and development outcomes, okay? So that's, you know, just more, yeah, that's, that's by way of context. Now let's jump to India, okay? Because this really is a book about India, right? Um, and at one level, India is doing really, really well. Okay, so I'm losing the titles of the slides. It's called India is doing well, how can it do even better, okay? Um, and and the, the simple point is, there are many, many great things about India, okay? So in the global landscape, the Indian economy is like one of the brightest spots. It is the largest growing large economy, um, expected to grow at almost double, like most of other major regions. Macro stability, we don't default on our debt uh, compared to you know other, other parts, even neighbors. The size, just the biggest country in the world, uh, most populous, makes it intrinsically important. The demographics in terms of the age structure are gonna matter massively as the rest of the world is aging. Um, uh, the democracy is a miracle, right? I mean, India, India has more people than the entire Western Hemisphere put together. Okay, it's more than North America, Central America, and South America put together. Okay, it's more than nearly like almost all of Africa. It's twice the size of Europe with a kind of diversity that's just unimaginable, right? So the political project that's modern India is an astonishing miracle. Okay, and something to be very proud of. And increasingly, you've got a diaspora that is in kind of positions of leadership around the world, including being CEOs of many Fortune 500 companies. Companies. And so all of this kind of really kind of, you know, are huge assets for India. But we also face profound challenges, okay, and especially on basic service delivery. So on um, basic aspects like education, you've got over 50% of kids complete primary school in rural India without being able to read at a second grade level, okay? So uh, you've got kids who are educated but really don't have any meaningful skills. Uh, you've got 35% of kids are stunted under five, which means two standard deviations below on height relative to a global norm, and that permanently impairs cognitive development, brain functioning, and makes you susceptible to morbidity and illness throughout your life, okay? Uh, the police are woefully understaffed, undertrained, overworked. And one of the ways in which that manifests in economic productivity is very low labor, female labor force participation, partly because of the safety concerns. And we have a lot of evidence on that. Uh, the justice system is creaking. While there is rule of law, you've got a backlog of 30 million cases, okay? And many cases can take years um, to resolve. And often the process is the punishment, okay? So, um, and, and then you've got a welfare system that exists, but is really weak, as you saw during COVID. And then crucially, the challenge of jobs is something that every government like is struggling with. Okay, so the simple way to tell the story, and again, all of this sounds very negative. That's why, you know, as academics, we tend to focus on kind of what's negative so that you can improve it. But it's important to recognize in the grand scheme of things, this is actually, there's a lot to be proud of. Okay, so my overall grade of India is like a solid B plus, right? I mean, which is, you know, above average in a bunch of things, but can do better. Okay, and that's, that's, what, that's what the book is about. Okay, now, the simple story of the Indian economy is that basically you've got a top 10% that drives demand and growth, okay? And uh, you've got another 30 to 40% in service sector jobs that are supporting the demand created by this top 10%. And the remaining 50 to 60%, primarily in rural India, like are mostly left out of the growth process and supported by a growing menu of welfare programs, okay? Now, and it's because of these numbers that the politics of the country primarily revolves around which party announces which welfare scheme because that's kind of what, that's how you get the votes, okay? Now, at some level, this model has worked pretty well, okay? So, because the good news for India is 10% of 1.4 billion people is still a lot of people. That's what, that's 140 million people. That's twice the size of Italy, right? And so that gives you like enough people to kind of power innovation, startups, have, you know, all the, every major Fortune 500 company has a global capability center in India, okay? So this is the part that's really driving, okay, India. And it's a model that's worked pretty well because you, generate the growth, and then you redistribute that. 
But part of my argument here is that India can't function at full potential, right? So if you look at the East Asian countries that did eight, nine, 10% growth in their peak years, a key part was that they managed to deliver universal high quality education, much better kind of basic health, much better basic public services, okay? So, so the point here is that to get to full potential, you're going to have to invest in the human development and human capital of that bottom 50% of the socioeconomic distribution. And that in turn is constrained by weak state effectiveness in the delivery of essential public goods and services. Okay, so again, the Indian state is remarkably effective in what's called mission mode. Okay, so mission mode is when you have a well defined project with a well defined timeline. Okay, where so we run the world's largest elections, we run the world's largest vaccination campaigns, we run like incredible disaster relief operations and some of these are the best in the world okay so the state is actually very capable but on those tasks it takes its resources and focuses them right but on a day-to-day -day basis when you have to do basic service delivery that's where there's a long way to go. Now, there have also been improvements in this area in the past decade, in particular, the use of technology, biometric ID, like direct benefit transfers to citizens' accounts, has helped to cut through layers of corruption and significantly improve the delivery of certain government services, okay? But there's a long way to go in these human intermediated services, like education, health, law, justice, right? Because you can't the technology can't intermediate away the human discretion and human engagement, okay? So to kind of look at this challenge, here's a quote from um, a former deputy governor of India Central Bank and one of the architects of the 91 economic reforms who basically says, the way forward for accelerated growth is being held back by major governance deficits in all areas connected with the delivery of public goods and services. And Lan Pritchett, who's always more provocative, basically says, the weak performance of the Indian state is one of the 10 greatest challenges facing humanity, okay? And he puts this on par with climate change because of the number of people affected and the sheer scale of the problem and how intractable it seems, okay? So this is a big deal, right? Um, and so the reason for writing the book is really, but as we assess India at 75, there's almost no greater barrier to getting to full potential than building a more effective state, okay? And the other key thing in the book is most of these actions are at the state government level, okay? Whereas most of our policy discourse in India focuses on the federal government, but states in India are bigger than most countries, right? So the average Indian state is bigger than the average European country, okay? So, and part of the call is to think much more at that level um, to move this discourse forward, okay? So... So the book is 18 chapters. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. I'll come to that in a moment. Now, but the other reason for writing this book, it's not just that, hey, state capacity is important. The key reason for writing the book is, I think, and some of the reviews also say this, right, that this is a genuinely new argument with regard to development because the default approach to human development has been to say we need to increase the budget, okay? So most sectoral advocates who care for education or health will say we need to spend more money, okay? And that's not what I'm arguing, and that's because, A, we don't have the money, okay? So our tax-to-GDP ratio is 18% compared to OECD norms of 35%, okay? So you can't even just spend your way out of this because you don't have the money. And second, the money that is spent is spent so inefficiently, right, that the core reason for writing the book is that if I was to say one unifying fact across my 20 years of work in education, in health, in welfare, is that the return on investment of investing in governance and state effectiveness are often 10 times more than simply spending more money, okay? So if there's one message, one core message, this is that message, right? So because all of our public discourse focuses on what I call the top line of budget allocation, okay? But not the bottom line of impact. So because I'm really a public finance economist who's focused on understanding the translation of spending into outcomes, you see this. now. This one set of, because this is an academic talk, right? I actually have this slide with the studies um, because each of these are peer reviewed papers and top journals that have taken like six, eight, 10 years of work, okay? And, but let's just walk you through these examples in sec. So here's education where most of the money, right? Most of the money goes to unconditional salary increases for existing civil servant teachers, okay? But what the evidence shows is that that has zero impact on learning, okay? Simply paying people more gets you zero impact, okay? Because the governance and accountability are so weak, okay? In contrast, spending even three to 5% in ways that are linked to performance have huge effects, okay? So that's a simple example. There's a paper called Double for Nothing in the QJE, where you literally spend like billions of dollars more on teacher salaries and you get nothing, okay? Uh, 
even more recently has been our work on improving welfare programs, where you see this is this AER paper from 2016 that investing in kind of the smart cards and the biometric payments reduce corruption by 10 times more than the cost of the program, okay? And then more recently, there's an Econometrica paper on the labor market effects of better implemented public works programs. And the key insight is this, that one of the reasons we did this program was to improve the bargaining power of the poor and improve their market wages, okay? And what we find is that the effect of improving implementation is bigger than the effect of rolling the program itself, okay? So again, all of our attention focuses on kind of policy design, passing laws and passing budgets, and then implementation is seen as boring administrative work, okay? So, but one of the points I wanna make is that implementation is deeply intellectual work, okay? It's not kind of something that you can outsource to a bunch of managers. And that's because you fit, hit constraints all the time and thinking through how you alleviate those constraints is deeply intellectual work, okay? Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these examples, right? Um, child development, the recent paper in the JPE this year, um, just showing that, you know, we all know that the early years are the most important for skill formation, and India has the ICDS, the Integrated Child Development System Program. That's the world's largest early childhood program. It caters to 80 million kids, but it's staffed by one worker per center. And we found using a large scale RCT that just add, adding an extra worker on a half day shift to preschools focused on early childhood education, gave you significant improvements in learning outcomes and reduction in stunting, and that the return on investment we estimate was 20 times the cost, okay? But we don't spend our money on that, and most of the money goes to unconditional pay increases, and so this is low-hanging fruit that you're not acting on. And more recently, there's a very nice paper by a um, former Berkeley PhD student um, who's now a faculty member at the University of Delaware, and what Manaswini shows is that she's using just variation in judge assignment and showing that every extra district court judge is able to clear another 200 cases a year. But importantly, because the majority of these cases are land and credit, okay? So these are key factors of production that are being locked up because of the delays in the courts. And so she estimates that every judge actually increases total credit and, and economic activity by 30 times more than the cost of that judge, okay? So that's another example of this 10X ROI, 10 plus X ROI of investing in governance and state capacity, okay? Now, as economists, if I, so we've done all of this research, right? So, but as economists, what I've shown you is these are $100 bills lying on the sidewalk, okay? Like, I mean, if you're a private investor and if I told you that here's a menu of ideas that are gonna get you a thousand percent ROI, when an SNP is going to give you like 10% with huge volatility, you're going to say, how can I put more money here? Okay. So why are we not doing that? Okay. And that gets us to then needing to understand the politics and understand the incentives. Okay. So this is really just the big picture intro chapter about the case for state capacity. And then the book has these 18 chapters in four sections. And I'm going to spend about five, seven minutes on this key actors, okay? And this is the part where I start sounding like an organization sociologist, right? Because this doesn't come from economics, but it really comes from uh, reading about bureaucracy and, and political economy, okay? So what I wanna do is give you like a five minute history, right? About the nature of the modern state itself, okay? So when we say state capacity, I've just told you India does some things well and some things not so well, okay? So it's not easy to say it's weak state capacity. So the key is to use the Fukuyama framework of thinking about the scope of the state, which is what you try to do, and the strength of the state, right? Which is your effectiveness at doing what you try to take on, okay? And so the key point is that if you look at the history of the modern state, it's kind of evolved in three broad phases, okay? Where for most of human history, what you had was a security state where the main thing the government was doing was defense and law and order. And as Weber famously said, securing the monopoly and the legitimate use of force, okay? And one way of seeing this is that about 80% of national budgets, even in 17th century Europe, were being spent on defense, okay? So, and you do uh, historical analysis of budgets in ancient Rome and ancient Egypt, it's about 70 to 80%, okay? So defense is all you did because that was the existential threat. Okay, now it's only in the 18th and 19th century that you get the second phase of the state, which I call the industrial state, where governments now start taking tax money to build large scale public goods, roads, railroads, canals, water and sanitation, mass education. Okay, so all of this happens in the 19th century, and it's not an accident that this happens alongside the Industrial Revolution, okay, because till then, 
you don't have economies of scale in production. So it makes sense for production to be decentralized. But when you have such massive economies of scale, it makes sense to have the transport and the storage to produce in a few places, okay? Now, this is also the first time in human history that GDP per capita starts growing systematically. Okay, so till then you have growth, but the growth is absorbed by growing population. Okay, so this period of moving from extensive growth to intensive growth happens really only around this time. Okay, but along this growth comes massive increases in inequality. Okay, because who benefits from this growth? It's the people with physical capital, financial capital, human capital, right? So land, education, and, and, and capital to invest. And so partly in response to that inequality, you then get the third phase of the modern nation state, which is the welfare state, okay? And the welfare state is less than 100 years old. And now you get progressive taxation, social insurance, food security, healthcare, pensions, unemployment insurance, all of this happens relatively recently. Okay, it's less than 100 years old and takes off a little bit after World War II, after the Great Depression, but really in a big way after World War II, okay? So there's two key facts you need to, one is that welfare states are expensive and they're typically built only after countries reach middle income status of about $15,000 per capita, like 2011 adjusted. The second key insight is the extent to which the nature of the state is correlated with the extent of democracy, okay? So security states have no concept of individual voting rights or human rights, and kings do whatever they want, okay? They throw people in jail, and that's fine, okay? Now, what's interesting, and I think underemphasized in kind of the development discourse, is the extent to which the industrial state is a time of limited democracy. Okay, so the US and the UK like to think of themselves as these grand old democracies, okay? But these are highly flawed democracies because the vote is restricted to white property owning men, okay? Are the only people who have a vote. In some cases, maybe people with a college degree, okay? So it's not an accident that that is what creates the coalition for investing in capital goods because in the long term, the capital, the roads benefit the poor through market integration and lower prices. In the short term, it's capitalized in the property prices, okay? So it's not an accident that you only get the welfare state after universal franchise, okay? Because in any income distribution, if you're to the left of the median, you want more redistribution. If you're on the right, you want lower taxes, okay? So when the vote is restricted to the property owning upper class, you're not getting the political push for redistribution, okay? So the political demand for the welfare state happens only after universal franchise, okay? And there's a ton of micro studies that show this, right? So again, I'm pulling together a body of micro studies to then situate this in a broader history. This is only six pages of chapter two, okay? This is just situating this. Now, why am I telling you this, okay? I'm telling you this because India is this incredible exception in human history, okay? So I'll come to that in a moment. So this is just showing you that the welfare state is remarkably recent, okay? So this is just social expenditures fraction of GDP. And it shows up a little bit in 1930s. So Bismarck's Germany has some, but that's restricted to formal industrial class workers, not the entire population, okay? So population-wide welfare really picks up after World War II, and that's because it's expensive. And so to run a welfare state, you first need the fiscal capacity to do that. And that, and that means the administrative ability to tax and the political willingness to be taxed, okay? And both of those pick up in times of war. And that's why Charles Tilly famously said, it's war that made the state, okay? So at, at, at an existential time of war, you're willing to be taxed and you build the administrative capacity. And then the peace dividend after the peace is what becomes your modern welfare state, okay? And so. So there's two key points. One, but I say it's expensive. Second, the reason I'm giving you this background is India is this incredible outlier in human history because we're the only country that had universal adult franchise on day one of independence. Okay, so this is a really powerful graph by Arvind Subramaniam and Rohit Lamba, basically showing that at comparable levels of GDP per capita, the US and the UK had democracy indices of about 2.5. So this is roughly the fraction of the population with a vote, okay? That's about 20, 25%. India starts close to 100% and stays there, okay? So this is an enormous outlier in human history, okay? And there are huge positives and huge challenges, okay? So what are the positives? So this is kind of democracy before development is a great moral triumph 
Okay, it's a great moral triumph because it's given every Indian citizen, including the most marginalized, to make a claim on the state. Okay, at a time when equivalent marginalized groups in the US and Europe had no claim on the state. And this is why India's democracy gives it a lot of soft power because the world understands how difficult it is and how much of an outlier it is. Right? So there's a moral triumph of India's democracy. Okay. Now, this has also provided meaningful policy wins for the poor. So one example is that the United States does food security for the poor through food stamps in the 1930s at a GDP per capita of about $18,000, PPP adjusted to 2000, and inflation adjusted to 2011. India does PDS for the poor in the 1960s. That's the public distribution system for universal food security. India does the PDS at a GDP per capita of $1,200. So the U.S. waited till it was 15 times richer before it did food security. India did free school feeding programs in the 1960s. And the U.S., even today in the vice presidential debates, Tim Walz is excited that he did free, free school lunches in Minnesota. And the Republicans are still arguing against that. Okay. So this is the way in which India has been, like the Indian democracy, has been a great moral triumph that also provided real policy wins for the poor. Okay, but the challenge is that it's created two fundamental challenges. Okay, if you are a prime minister or finance minister of India. And the first is the, is it, sorry, the meta point is that the scope of the state has expanded before the strength to meet that scope. Because you have now the demand for welfare before you have either the fiscal or the administrative capacity to do it well. Okay, so the first challenge is then the public finance challenge, which is the voter demand and political supply of welfare at a much lower level of income means that you don't have funds for investing in public goods, including the state itself. So when I say, why do we have the $100 bills on the sidewalk? It's because the political incentives have always been towards investing in visible welfare as opposed to longer term investments in the state. So the problem is not welfare, okay? So it can easily be interpreted as saying that I'm criticizing democracy or criticizing welfare. No, because the democracy is an amazing thing and welfare is also wonderful, okay? Because the, like I was discussing today afternoon with the fellows, the key, a key insight in development economics is that when people are very poor, well-designed welfare programs can improve equity and efficiency, okay? So welfare can improve growth if done well. So the problem is not welfare. The problem is that you're trying to do welfare on a very weak state. And so the quality of the welfare expenditure is really poor. Okay. And that creates the first vicious cycle, which is low state capacity, poor quality of spending, and lack of funds for investing in state capacity. Now, the second vicious cycle this creates, which political scientists have talked about, right, is there's kind of many political scientists studying democracy in India or Africa will often talk about clientelism. Okay. But the idea of clientelism is almost discussed in a semi-orientalistic way as to say, oh, these places, like, you know, they have all of this clientelistic politics. But what I'm providing is a very simple framework to make sense of that, okay? Which is essentially the political economy challenge is you have, you create a politics of scarcity, okay? Because you have expanded people's ability to make a claim on the state before the state has the capacity to meet those claims. So then the nature of politics becomes, how do I get the public benefits for my group as opposed to broad-based public goods? And this is magnified in situations of high social fractionalization. So Africa has tribes and the national borders often don't correspond to tribal identities. And so that creates these microcosms of cleavages. And India is like the mother of cleavages, right? Given the diversity we have. So, you know, we've got every possible cleavage on, on language, on religion, on region, on caste. And so what that means, that combined with the electoral incentives of the first past the post system, it's often more rational for politicians to cultivate base voters of 20%. So our basic political economy median voter theorem breaks down when these are turnout elections as opposed to convince the median election, right? We know that, but it's magnified in these highly fragmented settings. 
Because when you have five parties or six parties, as often used to happen, you just need 20% of the registered voters to win. And so then you're better off getting intense support from a smaller group. And that creates the political economy vicious cycle. Okay, so these are then the two fundamental challenges that Indian development has navigated. Okay, now people often say, does this mean we democratize too early? No, right? Because I'm not passing a judgment on that, right? Because it's very, a lot of Indians have a China fetish or a Singapore fetish and saying, if only we managed to do that, we would do better. But for every one strong man, there are four disasters, okay? So the research is quite clear that on average, democracies do better and democracies almost certainly have lower volatility. Okay, so the problem is not the democracy. The problem is a social scientist just understanding what the consequences of democracy before development are, and then recognizing, therefore, that the core constraint when people say, why has Indian democracy not delivered better? The constraint is not intention. The constraint is capacity. And that has huge implications for how we think about what we need to focus on. So, for example, for the lawyers in the room, right? India has a long tradition of rights-based legislation of trying to get the state to do more for the poor by passing laws and rights. But the challenge often is not the laws, the challenge is you don't have the resources to implement the law. Which means our aspirations cannot run ahead of our capacity. And this is also complicated by the fact that so many of India's elites are educated abroad that they come with ideas from settings with 20 times higher GDP per capita and then try to implement that in settings that are just completely incapable of implementing those ideas. And as I'll show you examples, that can often make things worse. Okay, now, where is the ground for optimism? Because the book is a technocratic book, okay? But the reason I have these two chapters is I need to first make the optimistic case for why political leaders and bureaucratic leaders would want to act on the agenda, okay? And the case of optimism is that the nature of political incentives in India is changing as education and technology have spread, the data shows that performing state governments are more likely to get reelected. okay? So what that means is that there is an old politics of identity and polarization, and there's a new politics of governance and service delivery, okay? So I'm not saying the old politics is over, but the old politics only gets you 15 to 20% of the vote. The next 20% that you need to win, you need to deliver. And so the better performing politicians are getting reelected. And which means there is political demand, but they are frustrated with the inability of the state to deliver. Okay. And so the politicians are increasingly now blame the bureaucrats. I've heard this now from so many politicians, but that's also unfair. And that's why the, the chapter two is called the politician's predicament. The chapter three is called the bureaucracy's burden. Okay. Since you can't see the titles. And the reason it's unfair to blame the bureaucracy is that the politicians are expecting them to do so much more than they have invested in their capacity, right? And this is the result of chronic underinvestment over time that the bureaucracy is understaffed, has limited autonomy. There's a whole bunch of problems we can talk about, okay? But the key point, there are two or three key things to understand is one of the reasons the bureaucracy is not so effective is because it's built on a skeleton of a colonial state that was designed to extract from the population and not to serve. So even today, the most powerful government official in a district administration is called a district collector. Why? Because his main job was to collect taxes, right? And there's nice analogies I have from Bollywood movies, okay, that kind of make this clear. So the nature of the state, there's a whole bunch of pathologies in the design, okay, which is all in that chapter that reflects this colonial legacy. But it's not just that. There are also political factors of the politicians wanting a pliable and controllable bureaucracy. Because remember, a, a well-functioning Weberian bureaucracy will follow the rules in allocating public benefits. But a politician who wants to allocate public benefits to his base voter wants a pliable bureaucracy. Right? So over time, the politicians have found ways to kind of impede with bureaucratic autonomy. There are economic factors, which is if you're a company, you can, you know, you lose, if you're losing money, you go out of business, but government departments can lose money forever with no incentives. There are judicial factors, and this is then an example of how a well-intentioned judiciary can often make things worse. Okay, I'll come to that in a moment. 
that there's risk aversion. And then before a lot of kind of private sector people in India will say, hey, listen, the private sector does so well, we just need more privatization. But that also doesn't work because the government's work is inherently more challenging. Okay, the private sector can, I, I, you know, in the private sector, you make 80% of your money from 20% of your customers. You're not obligated to serve everyone. The government has to serve everyone. So the task is often inherently much more difficult. And then there's this point about premature load bearing, okay, that comes from Land Pritchard. And it's a very powerful and important idea. And the intuition is imagine you're a weightlifter, okay, and you're trying to build strength. You lift two kilos more or one kilo more every day so that your muscles slowly build the strength. But if you try to lift like 200 kilos on day one, you'll just die, right? So similarly, if you overburden a system relative to what it can do, it gets weaker, okay? And so that's kind of what premature load bearing is because when I'm trying to do so much, you're putting the system under so much stress that the time it spends allocating benefits and adjudicating benefits, it's time that's not serving. So the subtle point, therefore, is kind of really highlighting for kind of the rights-based community in India, not to say that the rights don't matter, but it has to go hand in hand with the capacity. Okay, so to summarize, on the bureaucracy side, India has not yet completed the transition from being a colonial state designed to rule the population to a modern democratic state designed to serve them. And so when you look at the political scientists and their summary of Indian democracy, people like Ram Guha or Ashubashni will famously say it's 50-50 or battles half won. Okay? And what I'm providing is a framework to make sense of that characterization. So the success of Indian democracy, the class half full, is you've given a voice to the poorest. The limitation, so you've given a voice to the poorest to make a claim on the state, but you haven't managed to build the capacity of the state to meet those claims. And that's why I argue that the task of building a more effective state is the great unfinished task of Indian democracy itself. Because the miracle of Indian democracy, again, think about the tension between markets and democracy, right? Because democracy, the democratic ideal is one person, one vote. Whereas the market values you on a one dollar, one vote principle, right? And so the state is the site where every citizen is equal. And so then if you want to convert democratic empowerment, into services, then the state needs to be able to deliver. And that's why this is then becomes an agenda that's not just a technocratic agenda, but almost a moral agenda, okay? But the core of the book is technocratic, right? So how much time do I have, 15 minutes? Yeah, okay. So let me keep this down and stay, because I think I started at about 5.15, right? After all the intros and everything. Okay, we shall keep this. Uh, okay, so, but then we've just started, right? So what I've given you is just like capsule summaries. So each of these chapters has enough content to be a mini book and there's no enough references behind it, but written in a very accessible way, okay? Now, the core intellectual contribution going back to how do you build an effective state really draws on principles of org sociology that we were talking about lunch. That the principles of an effective state here apply to any organization, which is, what, else, what is the data you're measuring? What are the outcomes you're working towards? What drives the personnel policies? What are people hired and promoted for? Because the values you reward in your promotion structures are the values that become the values of the organization itself. Okay, that's like a core principle of org sociology. Where are the budgets going? Okay, so what I'm doing, I'm going to tell you in each of these slides, one slide per chapter, is it's going to sound very depressing because I'm going to highlight some of the challenges. But the point is now coming, connecting the micro and the macro. All of this is now coming from high quality individual studies that have not been put together in this framework. Okay, so here is now a simple slide on data. So this is from a very simple but powerful paper by Abhijit Singh. It's at the Stockholm School of Economics, right? And what this side is showing you is data, official data on learning outcomes in Hindi from a state that was considered a best practice in learning measure. So they measured every single child. And the idea was to say, we will identify if you're not at basic standards and we will give you the support, okay? But look at this, in the official data, this is kids organized from weakest to strongest. In the official data, there's nobody under 65%. Now, what Abhijit did was do a simple audit study where he resampled a bunch of the same kids and tested them on the same questions two months later. 
And the true learning levels are here. So you see the official data is inflated by factor three and here nobody scores above 65%. Now, this is not just a research study. This is kind of highlights how we have wasted 20 years as a country. Why? Because since 2005, we've had independent surveys showing that there's a learning crisis, okay? That kids are not learning. But the government, even unofficially, they accept it. Officially, they can only react based on official data. And in the official data, there's no crisis. So something as mundane as data integrity is kind of the foundation of the entire system. Okay? So in the case of malnutrition, we've now got ongoing data from ongoing work. Okay? That shows when you do the independent audit, this is the official data. In the official data, like miraculously, like if I compare what fraction of kids are in any continuous distribution, there should be no break at zero. But the, the probability mass just above the malnutrition threshold will be like 10 times higher because nobody wants to show that the outcomes are bad, right? And that's then an incentive design problem because the frontline worker doesn't want to get yelled at, doesn't want to create extra work. And then the chapter gets into like I mean, all of the reasons for this as well as some of the practical solutions. Okay, personnel. The core of the state is your staffing. And coming back to bureaucracy's burden, India is actually one of the most understaffed states in the world. We think of India as this big bloated bureaucracy, but employees per capita is one-tenth the levels in Scandinavia, one-tenth. And it's about one-fifth even of the US, which we consider to be the paragon of free markets in no state. Now, why is this? It's because Indian government employees are among the most overpaid in the world. Now, the very top folks are underpaid, but for a variety of political reasons, that public sector unions are so strong that over time, all the budgets go into unconditional pay hikes of existing employees, which makes it hard to hire more people. And this is from another study of mine where you see that the average government teacher salary is about six times higher than the average private salary. This is from 2012, but you know, even with inflation, those patterns will stay the same. Here's public finance. So it's a very, very simple picture, but one of the most foundational conceptual pictures in the book. So the simple idea is in any private sector company, okay, if you have to invest a million dollars, you will need to make some discounted cash flow analysis to justify what the ROI is and why are you making this investment. In government, you can invest, spend a hundred million, a billion without any such discipline. Okay, so the first point is just to analyze the efficiency effects of public expenditure by estimating the ROI. But governments are also about equity, okay, not just about efficiency. So the simple two by two says, let's take every major government expenditure item and just classify them on an efficiency and equity axis. And the book then provides principles of how do you estimate this, okay? But the key point is that most of our public discourse, so there's an inequality workshop tomorrow, which I'm going to miss because I have to travel early in the morning. But if I was to present there, the main point I would make is from this picture, okay? That most of our discourse on inequality tends to focus on ideas between these two regions because normally ideas to improve equity will hurt efficiency and vice versa. But the point I'm making is what the research identifies is there are so many ideas that can improve both equity and efficiency that we are not doing. In contrast, we spend so much money on things that hurt both equity and efficiency. So let me, again, and all of these points are based on high quality studies, which then illustrate the points. So the studies are there, but the frameworks are new of how to take those studies and put it in this frame. So if you look at say just farmer welfare, We've got the NREGS, or Rural Welfare, okay, National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. And that was an econometric paper that just came out last year. And I consider that perhaps the most important paper I've written in my career because it overturned my priors so much that here was a program that many economists were suspicious about. But we found that not only did it improve equity, but it also dramatically improved efficiency because putting money in the hands of the poorest was a demand stimulus in the rural economy. And you were counteracting monopsony power of local landlords. So that's an example of a welfare program that sits up here, okay? But in contrast, we spend billions of dollars on farmer welfare, okay? On incredibly inefficient programs like free electricity for farmers. 
And the free electricity for farmers may have made sense in the 1960s when you were worried about a national food security crisis. But 60 years later, it's horrendous for equity because the top 5% of landowners get 50% of the subsidy. It's bad for, so when you want to think about quality of welfare expenditure, I have a framework that says, let's think about targeting delivery distortions. Okay, So it's bad on targeting, it's bad on delivery, and it also distorts the pattern of cropping and creates a groundwater crisis, not to mention contributes to the pollution in North India because farmers in Punjab and Haryana are growing paddy and then burning that stubble, which they have no business growing in the first place because of the free electricity. But that's an example of a well-intentioned farmer welfare policy so the point is not to do farmer, not to not do farmer welfare, but you can do that in much, much more efficient ways. Okay, so this is a foundational framework that then shows up in chap in every chapter. Okay, I'm going to skip the revenue, the federalism, India. You know, the funny thing is, we think in India, most Indians think that China is the strong centralized government, but in fact. China, if you look at the total fraction of government expenditure that happens at local government, China is one of the most decentralized with about 50% at the local government level. In India, that's only 3%. So India is one of the most over-centralized countries in the world, which violates all our first principles of federalism about where service delivery should sit. Now, there's a complex history for this, which is sociological, which maybe I'll take up in the Q&A. So this is, again, not to criticize India, but... Every chapter is takes a social science view as to say, why are we the way we are? Okay, it's not just here are the facts. Here are the deep historical and contextual reasons for why we are the way we are. Here is why that has outlived its utility. And here is how you need to reform. Okay, so that's federalism. And then one of this is called state in the market. And one of the consequences of a weak state is a mass exit to the private sector. Okay, and the simple point here is that the government is a policymaker, is a regulator, and is also a provider. And the way you see the private sector is different in those roles. As a policymaker, the private sector is your ally because you care about delivering for the people, regardless of who delivers. As a regulator, you have to treat public and private equally. But as a provider, the private is your competition. Okay? Now, the problem is that over 95% of government budgets and people go to government as provider, which means they have a very hostile reaction to the private sector in general. Often, so I'll give you one very simple example. Our civil aviation policy was messed up for 70 years. And a country like Singapore, that's a man-made island with no history, has more tourists than India with this kind of 2,500-year civilization. And one of the reasons is that Singapore Airlines had open Singapore had open skies. Any airline could come, drop, pick up passengers, go. Whereas India tried to restrict capacity on bilaterals to protect Air India's market share. Because if I expand market share, Air India is not competitive. So to protect market share for Air India, they restricted supply. So that's an example of a completely harebrained policy that was hurting the economy, designed because as a provider, we were trying to protect the public. So it just, but this shows up again in sector after sector. So thinking about leveraging the market. So the key point, again, there are high quality micro studies, okay, RCTs, market level studies, right? There is so much we've learned in the last 20 years. Okay, that's the basis for what I'm saying. Okay. So a key point is that you can massively increase public welfare by paying more attention to making markets work better and leveraging private players. But even that requires state capacity. So it's not enough to say that a voucher model could do better because even the procurement and the regulation need state capacity and you don't have that either. So even to use the market, you need state. So this is also a way to kind of the naive privatizers. It doesn't work. You need an effective state, even to leverage the private sector. Okay, so my last bit now is I'm going to be optimistic. Okay, so all of this sounds very bleak, but remember I said, we're still a solid B plus, okay? So here's a simple but very important picture. And it just shows the x-axis is GDP per capita. The y-axis is life expectancy. And this is a pattern you will see for every developing outcome that high income countries and states have better outcomes, okay? So there are three facts here. The first is notice that India actually does better than expected. So that's why it's a B plus. So I've given you a whole list of problems, but that's like, you know, that, that's just saying we can do better. 
but there are many, many things to be proud of. Okay? So we are above average. But the second and deeper point I want to make in this picture is the picture captures one of the great development debates of the past 60 years, okay? which is the growth versus development debate. So because high-income countries do better in everything, the growth view is that if you get 2% faster growth every year for 30 years, like China did, everything else is second order. Okay, so just focus on the growth. Okay, now on the other hand, is the development view prominently of Amartya Sen and John Brez, who would say the purpose of development is not GDP per capita. The purpose of development is human capabilities. And that means focusing more on education and health. And they will focus on the outliers and say, look, countries like Vietnam and Sri Lanka and Cuba and Kerala managed to achieve much better health and education outcomes, even without being rich. And so the poster child here would be if you compared in 2021, the year of COVID, Sri Lanka had a higher life expectancy than the US, even though the US's GDP per capita is 15 times higher. Okay, so the point of the development folks is to say that you can deliver better by focusing on the social sector. Okay, now why am I giving you this? Because I'm trying to fundamentally change this debate. And my argument is that at one level, both sides are right, okay? Clearly, more growth helps human development. More human development helps growth. So what are we fighting about? So in the end, that fight ends up being an ideological fight where the center right prefers capex and infrastructure and says, let's do growth. And the center left wants more social spending. But my point of departure is this is a zero-sum debate about budget allocation. The real elephant in the room is that the quality of expenditure is so bad, regardless of whether I'm doing capex or social sector. So if you focus more on the efficiency of public spending, you can do more of everything and you don't have to choose, right? So very simple economics way of saying this is you're so far inside the production possibility frontier that you're arguing about that budget trade-off. But the free lunch is investing in better now. So now to get optimistic, this is perhaps the great, greatest triumph of development of the second half of the 20th century, okay? So what is this showing us? The x-axis is GDP per capita, y-axis is life expectancy. And you see that from 1930 to 1960, this shifts up. In 2015, it goes further up, okay? And the main point here is it shows us that even at the same level of income, countries are doing better over time. Which means that I can do better over time even without getting richer. And so what's the secret sauce? The secret sauce is better technology, new knowledge, right? So in health, this was everything from antibiotics to ORS to a whole bunch of public health measures that allow us to do much better. Okay, And this reflects the fact that health is perhaps the field with the best tradition of evidence-based practice. Randomized controlled trials, evidence reviews, systematic reviews that then make its way into policy. So now the question is, can we do this for every other sector? How, and that's why the book is called Accelerating Development. Right? So what can we do to accelerate development? What do developing countries have today that high-income countries did not have 20 years ago? And what we have is much better data and evidence. And we have much better technologies that can be used to implement these ideas at scale. So the entire empirical revolution in economics of the last 20 years has meant there's been an explosion of data sets, explosion of computing power, an explosion of better research methods that's helped us identify that there are many very expensive policies and programs that have no impact, many very inexpensive ideas that could massively improve outcomes that we're not doing enough. And so where is the free lunch? The free lunch is move your public spending from things that are completely ineffective to things that we're not doing. And since we're all researchers, this is kind of my ode to research. Why does research matter so much? Because as economists, I don't worry about how does Toyota make its cars because it faces market prices for inputs, market prices for outputs. If you're not efficient, you're competed out. But in the public sector, you can spend other people's money badly for a very long time. And so the value of research and evidence to guide public spending is especially important. Okay, so just to wrap up, 
Um, all right, I'm gonna take just two minutes on this slide, okay, because this will, you'll remember this more than anything else, because I wanna give you one example. So one of, I consider this picture to be one of the most important pictures for understanding education in developing countries, okay? So this comes from a large scale study with Abhijit Singh from about 6,000 kids in the state of Rajasthan. So again, the X axis is the year, the grade in which you're enrolled. The Y axis is your learning level. So what this shows is that if a child was making progress as per the curriculum, in eighth grade, you should be at the eighth grade level. In practice, the rate of progress is about half of the curriculum. So the average eighth grade student in rural India is at about a fourth grade level of understanding of math, okay? Now, the deeper point is now with dynamic computer-aided testing, we can pinpoint where every child is. So what that tells you is that in this eighth grade classroom, there are kids at eighth grade level, at seventh, at sixth, at fifth, all the way up to second grade level of understanding. Now, why is this happening? Because we had this well-intentioned no detention policy that was trying to prevent dropouts and automatically moving kids to the higher grade, even if they had not mastered prior grade content. So now this means if I'm an eighth grade teacher, I have an almost impossible task of trying to teach kids at that level of variation. Now, why is this so important? Because this helps us understand why does the budget not translate into outcomes? I can spend more money, I can hire more teachers, I can build a better classroom. But if you're teaching at a level that is so far above where the kids are, it's not translating into impact. Right? So I don't know so what have I just done to you? Right? I just gave you 30 to 45 seconds in the shoes of a typical kid in a typical classroom in millions of schools around the world. And so what we've done as part of universal education is we've managed to increase enrollment. But the kids are sitting in class so far behind what's happening that that helplessness you felt for that minute is the daily feeling. Daily feeling. But that's then the power of the research. Because now we can show this and help guide the interventions. Right? And so this is what the Nobel Prize in 2019, the teaching at the right level that was identified was something they focused a lot on. And we are now doing work on dynamic computer-based testing to then alleviate the challenge even in middle school. But that's an example of the power of research to then guide better public spending. So to wrap up, if you wanna shift India's Preston curve for governance, on the current rate, we are at a stunting rate of 35%. And if you continue at the current run rate, even at 6% growth, if you look at that income elasticity, we'll still be at 25% in 2047. If you grow at 8%, you get to 22%, okay? But if you double the effectiveness of spending going forward, then you go from 25 to 17. And that in turn makes it more likely you'll get 8% growth and you're more likely to end up here. Okay, the same thing in education, on the current run rate, you'll still have 16% of kids not be able to read, but a similar process can bring that forward to 2030. Okay, so the reason I spend most of my time on early childhood education, nutrition, and school, primary school, is the future of these children is yet to be written. Okay, when I focus on skills, it's often too late with the 18 year old. Okay, and we know what to do. We know what to do. Okay, so just, and the, and the consequences of doing this is another 120 million kids who would graduate in the next 25 years without being able to read or being able to. Okay, so to wrap up, this is, this is then coming back to the overall structure of the book. So the reason it's big is really two books, okay? So there's one half, which is about building an effective state. And the second half is then how do you use that to accelerate development? And the reason for picking these six sectors is in doing this, we don't have to choose between Bhagavati and Sen, between growth and development. 
because every one of these sectors is intrinsically important for human welfare, which is the Amartya Sen view. But they're also instrumentally important for economic growth. And so the other key goal of this book, though, you know, is that public discourse is often so polarized, is I'm trying to find an agenda that can build a broad political consensus. Because if you're left, then there is no better way to deliver equity and justice at scale than building a more effective state. And if you're on the right, you care about improving effectiveness of value for money and laying the foundations for better long-term growth. Okay, so the core of the book is technocratic, but it's book ended by politicians, bureaucrats, institutions, and society, right? So it's basically saying, here are the incentives and constraints of these key actors. Why should they want to do this? And the last two chapters say, if they don't want to do it, what can citizens and society do? And therefore, accentuating the agency of citizens in kind of making this happen. And then the value of institutions is it's not enough for one government to make a change, but you really want this to then become a new way of functioning. And that requires paying attention to institutionalizing these practices. Okay, so that's why it's a big book, but let me stop there. And thank you for indulging me and look forward to your questions. <laughs>